Today I want to start a message series. I know, it's crazy, right? We just got out of one and I usually don't do them. But as I was preparing, the Lord said, I want you to, to really start to focus on something. I want you to start to bring an idea back to the church, back to the people. And the idea is this. The series is going to be called In the Midst. In the Midst. And there are some things that the Lord wants us to be aware of. There are some things that he is restoring, things that he's bringing back to the church. And I will tell you first and foremost that Jesus Christ wants to be in our midst. He, he is in our midst. When two or more are gathered in my name, he said, there I will be also. He's in our midst. But today I want to talk to you about the idea of praise and worship. Praise and worship. In Psalm 150 and verse 6, you may be familiar with this verse, but if not, in the book of Psalm 150, verse 6, it says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Everything that has breath breath not everything that can carry a tune not everything that is just a worship pastor or worship leader or not everything that just likes music but everything that has breath praise the lord praise and worship is such an integral part of the christian life it's an important part of a church service. Most of the time when you go to a church service, there will be some form of praise and worship that happens. And oftentimes, praise and worship helps to usher us into a place where we're ready to hear the Word of God. But I would tell you that we often limit praise and worship to singing and music. But praise and worship can be done without musical instruments. It can be done without singing. But music is simply an avenue that we use to praise and worship God. But in the Bible, in the book of Colossians, it tells us in Colossians verse 3 and 20 or chapter 3, I'm sorry, in verse 23 it says, "And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. So we have this idea that in our everyday lives, we should continue this spirit of praise and worship, living our life in praise and worship and honor to God. Everything that you do, from the moment that you wake up until the moment that you close your eyes in sleep, what you should be focused on is am what I am doing bringing honor to the Lord? Am I lifting up a praise to the Lord in what I'm doing? Am I showing other people that the Lord is with me? Simply in the way that I carry myself, in the way that I talk to them at work, in the way that I respond to a situation that is happening. But more often, in daily grind of life, we have a spirit of complaining and griping, right? Sometimes in life, I have a spirit of complaining and griping. Let me put it that way. I'll put it on myself. I find myself wanting to complain about things. And let me tell you, life gives us plenty of reasons to complain, Maybe you're sitting beside, no, I won't go there. But life gives us plenty of reasons to complain. You know what I mean? We gripe, we complain. And so we go through this cycle, because we just went through a little bit of a time of praise and worship, and everybody's in this good setting, and you're feeling good, and the air conditioning's feeling good, and we're not 
roasting like we were last week, and hopefully we're not freezing yet. We're going to find that happy medium. But we're in this hallelujah phase, right? Hallelujah. We could just keep hallelujah. You know what I mean? That's how we're feeling right now. It's good. We just sang about the Lord. We're not in charge of our children right now. Somebody else is watching them. Hallelujah. <laughs> but then we get out to the parking lot, and we find out that someone has opened their car door and put a big ding in the side of our vehicle out there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then you wake up tomorrow morning, and you're late. <clears throat> you missed your alarm. You're late for work. Hallelujah. Right? You hit every traffic light on the way. I seem to catch every traffic light. Every traffic light. Every time I'm going somewhere, every single light in town, I seem to catch. My wife can attest to that. She seems to get all of them. Of course, she gets them whether they're red, green, yellow. It doesn't matter. She gets them. But you know, every traffic light you hit, the kids are screaming and arguing in the back seat. There's breakfast flying all over the place because you got up too late for them to eat it at home. Hallelujah. And you start to, tr to change this idea of praise and worship that you just had not even 24 hours ago. And now it's, why God? Why God is this happening? Why God? You changed your idea of praise and worship. And it's so easy to start complaining and start griping. And then you start to think about what God has done. You start to set your mind upon what he has done for you, the blessings in your life, your family, your spouse. It doesn't take long for you to realize that we have every reason to continue to praise and continue to worship and to continue to give God glory for what he's done. Even in the midst of the red lights and the oatmeal that's thrown in your hair and all of those things that happen, all of life's little qualms and things that go on, in the midst of that, we still have every reason to continue to praise God. Now, does that mean that we are in the car singing for God so loved. You could. You can. But it doesn't mean that you have to do that. And I want to get that through to you this morning. It doesn't just have to be singing. It doesn't have to just be musical. But you can just say, God, praise you for what you've done. The Bible says lift up a shout of praise. That will quiet your car down real quick. Everything's chaotic. You're running late. The kids are screaming. They're fighting over who gets this side of the seat. You've been there before, okay? He's on my side. She's on my side. And you just start to say, "Woo! praise the Lord for what you've done. And they just look at you like, what? So what are they used to? What are they used to hearing? If I could read, you know, you're reaching around the seat trying to get at them. You know, how many of you have children? You've done that. You're reaching around the seat. If I could reach you, we get wherever we're going, don't make me stop this car. You know, I get it. I've been there. I've been there. We were at, yesterday we were in Cleveland. We went up to see uh, the Guardians. <clears throat> Indi Indians. I mean, the Guardians. We saw the Guardians play yesterday. Sorry, I can't get that straight. But uh, there was a lady parked beside the, the road and she was getting into the back of her vehicle, and man, that kid was just, there was a kid in there in a car seat, and he was just wailing a tune, you know. And so my sister walks by, and if you've ever seen The Hunger Games, she just holds, holds up, you know, we're with you, you know. I know it's hard to praise God in those moments. Like, thank you, Lord, that everybody's looking at me while my kid is screaming while I'm trying to get things into the car. But you know, we should. We should. Reading your Bible, doing a devotion, spending time in the Word of God can be an act of worship. It's an act of worship unto God. It's an act of praise unto God. Just meditating on what the Lord has done for you in your life, just thinking about it. Just thinking about it. 
is a way that we can give God glory, give Him praise. Talking to others, talking to your children, talking to your grandchildren can be the most menial things ever. It can be the smallest things ever that you talk about. But bring into the situation, bring into the conversation a reason for them to hear you praise God. The other day I was driving with my oldest daughter. I was taking her to a tumbling class. And uh, I wasn't in the, the best mood because I was tired and we had just been at soccer practice. So we went from soccer practice to tumbling. And, you know, what's funny is when my wife and I got married, we told each other, we're not going to be those people. You know, we always saw people that were always doing stuff and running around everywhere. And it's, we're not going to be those people. And then here I am going from soccer to tumbling. That's what kids can do, you know, especially little girls, daughters, you know, they get you wrapped. But here we are on our way to tumbling, and I'm really not in a praising mood. I'm in a complaining mood because I'm tired, and this isn't what I really want to be doing. And so we're having a conversation in the time it takes us to get from soccer to tumbling, and she says, I said, how was your day today? You know, it was good. We had ice cream at school. The ice cream truck came to school today, and Mommy gave us each a dollar to get some ice cream. And I paused for a second. Now, I know it's a dollar. A dollar is a dollar, but when I was growing up, a dollar meant something. I know, our, you know in our current world, a dollar is not meaning as much as it used to, but it meant something to me. And I paused for a second. I said, you know what? I said, you know how blessed we are that you're able to do that, to take that dollar and get yourself an ice cream cone. And I thought about it to myself first. I thought, God, man, thank you for your provision so that, so that my child can get herself an ice cream cone. Pastor, it's only a dollar. Yeah, but think about the principle of the thing. It's the principle that God has blessed us. He has given us the ability that I don't have to, to worry about, and I know it's a dollar, but I don't have to worry about it, that we were able to give that, and they were able to enjoy that part of life. And I told her, I said, there are a lot of children that, you know, this doesn't happen for them. It's not a reality for them, okay? It's not. You know that, and I know that. It wasn't always a reality for me growing up. But I said, you know what? God has blessed us to be able to do that. And that was how I directed that. Anytime you can praise God, you can worship Him. You bring Him glory. It's an act of focusing our attention on Him. And whomever you give attention to, whatever you give attention to, you honor. Men, husbands, remember this. Whatever you give your attention to, you honor. So when your wife is talking to you and she's telling you things, okay, and all the ladies said, amen. Ladies, same thing. Same thing. Whatever you pay attention to, you give honor. Whatever you do. If you're sitting there on your device, I'll turn it on myself again. If I'm sitting there on my device and one of my children is trying to tell me something and I'm looking and checking an email, it might be important. Listen, things we do are important. But think about it. Whatever you're giving attention to, you're giving honor to. You're giving honor to. So we focus our attention. Youth kids that are here, we got some youth. The Bible says this, honor your father and your mother and your days will be long upon the earth. You want to know one great way to do this? Pay attention to them, what they're telling you. Parents of teenagers said, amen. Hear what they are saying. Don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. Obey what they are saying. Yes, the Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is right. So when we praise, when we worship, it's about giving our attention to God. It's about bringing our focus on Him. And a good worship leader 
is a good pointer. It's a good pointer. Pointing people to Jesus Christ. That's a good worship leader. Someone who points the people to Jesus Christ. It cannot be about the leader. If it's about him, it's not going to work. If someone is up here for themselves, if someone is up here for their own clout, for their own attention, to be somehow liked or they're wanting to deserve or they feel that they are worthy or they want to deserve all of that, it's not going to work. It's very hard to be led by someone who is always pointing at themselves. Look at me. Listen to me. This is me. I am great. That's not a good worship leader. A good worship leader doesn't want you to focus on them. They don't draw attention to themselves. Now, yes, they're leading you. They're going to direct you. But where are they leading you to? Does it stop with them? Or are they leading you somewhere past that? Because that's the point. And a good worship leader is a good pointer. We praise and we worship Jesus Christ. And he is here in our midst. And I want to talk to you today about the tabernacle. Many of you are familiar with the tabernacle, but I'll kind of give you an overview. The tabernacle of Moses was a structure. It was a tent, really. And it was set up, and there were lots of different pieces of furniture that were involved. There were priests that were involved from the tribe of Levi, the Levites. They were involved in the worship part. That's all they did. And each piece of furniture means something, and each covering of the tabernacle means something, and the dimensions and every part of it means something, and I'm not getting into all of that today. But what I will tell you is that the tabernacle consisted of the outer court, it consisted of the holy place, and it consisted of what we call the holy of holies. All right, so there's this principle of threes here that we see. And the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. So there were three items in there. The golden pot of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone. And they each represent something. They each do. The tablets that were broken represents man's rejection of God's standard. Okay? Aaron's rod that budded represents God's appointed leadership in your life. The golden pot of manna represents God's provision. Those are the three things. So this is what was placed into the holy of holies. And only the high priest could enter in to the holy of holies. It was the only person that could go in. And he went in on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, is when he went in. And he would go in and he would present a sacrifice. He would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and present a sacrifice. And if the sacrifice was accepted, then the whole nation was blessed. All right? And this is where the presence of God was, in the Holy of Holies. And so the priest would enter in. It was such a holy place that the priest had to be clean and perfect to enter in. So we have this idea of worship. We have this idea of worship. They're bringing a sacrifice to the Lord. They're bringing an offering before God in his presence. But it was at a distance. It was from a distance. And God is not a person who wants to be in a relationship with you from a distance. He wants to be in a relationship with you personally, relationally, close to you. He walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He wanted to be close. He wants to be close. He wants to have fellowship with his creation. He doesn't want to be worshipped from a distance. He wanted to be in the midst of the people. And so we see something happening. We see something that happens 
The Ark of the Covenant changes hands. It goes into the hands, actually, of the Philistines later on and causes all kinds of problems for them, so they give it back to Israel. But David, later on, much later, King David takes possession of the Ark of the Covenant. And I want you to go with me to Samuel, 2 Samuel verse 6. Sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 6, let's start there, and verse 17. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 17, because I want to show you something here. If you have your Bibles, or if not, it's up on the screen for you today. It says, and they brought the ark of the Lord, the ark of the covenant, and they set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Now, something interesting happens when David creates this place, just like the, the, the tabernacle of Moses, it was a tent. So David uh, pitches this tent, and he puts the Ark of the Covenant inside it. But something changes in David's tabernacle. What changes is that in Moses' tabernacle, there was a veil there was a curtain between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. And only one person, the high priest, could pass through that. But in David's tabernacle, there's no veil. It's open. It's a completely open, and, and, and you could stand, and people stood before the presence of the ark as it was open. The, 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 there was no veil there. And they stood before the presence. They looked upon the presence of God. They brought burnt offerings and peace offerings. And there was praise and there was worship. And the presence of God was found in the midst of the tabernacle. In the midst of the tabernacle was where the presence of God was found. And you have this idea of people gathering around. I'm not just talking about the Levites. I'm talking about all of the tribes, grandchildren, children, grandparents, moms and dads, gathering around in the presence of God and worshiping him. You see, when we worship God, when we praise God, we stand in his presence his presence becomes real to us. And you know what happened during this time? If you read on, it talks about how David blessed the people. He blessed the people. So here they are, standing, worshiping, praising with instruments. Instruments. I know there are some places that will say, we don't believe that you should use instruments. We don't believe that you should use drums and guitars and all of these different things they worshiped with instruments before the lord and david blessed the people and when you come to god with praise and with worship you come into his presence he will bless you he will bless you just as the king blessed the people, the king will bless you as you worship him and as you praise him. We also see that David fed the people. It says that he dealt to them bread, meat, and wine. And so when you come into the presence of God, when you praise and you worship the Lord, he will feed you in that place. And you'll leave that place feeling full, feeling fulfilled. How many of you, when you leave this place, do you feel full? Because God has fed you. He's blessed you. Well, pastor, you preach so long. I don't feel full when I leave here. I feel hungry. I'm not meaning that way. I know, blessed are the short-winded, for they'll be invited back. I try to stick to that verse. But God fills you up. He fills you up. 
and he feeds you. David brought the ark. He brought it with a shout. He brought it with the sound of a trumpet. Listen, some of us need to learn how to shout more. Amen? Amen. We need to learn how to shout. We need to lift up a praise for what the Lord has done. If something is said that resonates in your spirit, man, David lifted up a shout before the Lord. He didn't just lift up a mumble. He lifted up a shout across the land in front of the people. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't worried about what other people would think. He lifted up a shout. Psalms 134.2 says this. It says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. I don't understand you Christians why you all raise your hand. What are you doing that for? Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Now, there are different reasons that we lift up our hands. There are different reasons. And I've seen teaching on different, and we're not going to get into all those, but I'm just telling you that when someone does it, it's not a taboo thing that's happening. It's not something that you're looking at and saying, that's a little bit strange. Actually, what they are doing is obeying the word of God that says, lift up your hands and bless the Lord. And I've seen that happening here, and that blesses my heart. That blesses my heart, especially when I see the little ones, the smaller ones, the children, and they're looking to the bigger ones, and you're modeling that for them. Lift up your hands and bless the Lord in the tabernacle, in the sanctuary, and I see their little hands go up like that. They may not understand. Hey, you know what? You can tell them now. Hey, Daddy, why do you raise your hand at church? Because the Bible says lift up your hands and bless the Lord in the sanctuary. Praise the Lord. Psalm 63 and verse 4 says, Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Man, this is something that so many of us are missing. The idea. It's not to draw again. This doesn't say... I will lift up my hands in my name. It says, I'll lift up my hands in your name. I'm pointing to you. I'm giving the honor to you. I'm giving the praise to you. I stood yesterday and I watched at the, the baseball game. All of these people, thousands of people, 18,000 some hundred people that were at this game. And you know what they were doing? They were lifting their hands up and they were shouting to a bunch of men in tight pants playing baseball. That's what it was, right? If you think about it, it's no different for football. It's no different for any sport. They're out there. They look like gladiators. They've got helmets on. And what do people do? Man, they lift up a shout to this mere man, this mortal. I can hear them three blocks away when the Browns play, you know, I can hear lots of shouting going on when that happens. I told Brother Rick, one of the first times Brother Rick and I had, had met, we were talking. He loves the Browns. We were talking about the Browns, and I told him, I said, the verse I try to follow when I watch the Browns is watch and pray. Watch and pray. But you know, you hear shouting. You hear exclamation. You hear Hopefully not too much explicitives when people are watching. But I'm saying you hear these things. People are, people are just nuts at a sporting event. They paint their face. You know, they do all, I'm not expecting you to come in here with your face painted. That would be a little bit weird. But I'm saying they do all of these things. But one of the things that's so common that you see, it doesn't matter. Whenever you see a group of people and they're together and they're, they're bringing some type of an anthem, they're raising something up, across the crowd, you'll see the hands going up. The hands going up. Football games, it's up like this. Rock concerts, they're going like this. But their hands are in the air. You see, to me, that shows, that shows you that we were created to praise and worship. And yeah, there's some misplaced praising and worshiping going on. 
There's some misplaced, but internally, there's something about it that a group of people in that set in that setting, and nobody looked around at the game yesterday like, man, that's weird. That guy's he got his hands up. That's really strange. Now, do you have to lift your hands up to praise the Lord? No, you don't. You don't have to do that. The idea is not that I have my hands up. The idea is that I'm focusing my attention on God. I'm focusing my attention on the Lord and what he's done. And I will tell you, God wants to restore the tabernacle of David today. He wants to restore his presence to the center of our praise and of our worship. It's not about the production. It's not about the lights. It's not about the best multimedia that's possible. Okay? It's not. You know what? Money can buy all of those things. Money can put all those things in place. You can have the best multimedia. You can have the best production. You can have the best lighting. You've got LED screens going everywhere. You've got smoke. You've got fog. You've got hair and makeup, whatever you want to call it. And guess what? In the room, there's no praise and there's no worship happening. There's no praise and there's no worship but two men sitting in chains in prison. Two men sitting in chains in prison, probably with rats, probably with the the lowest of the low right there around them. Guess what they did? They didn't have lights. They didn't have a production. They didn't have any of that stuff, but they began to lift up a shout of praise, and the chains were broken in that place. They were in a dungeon praising the Lord. Didn't have any guitars, didn't have any drums, didn't have anything like that. But they praised the Lord. You see, we have this idea of the tabernacle of Moses. But David had removed something. The presence of God had went with David. He had taken the Ark of the Covenant and set up his tabernacle, and that's where the presence of God was. The Ark of the Covenant was in David's tent, and all of the people were singing, playing instruments, praising and worshiping the Lord in his presence. In his presence. It's not about where the tent is. It's not about where the people are. It's about where the presence of the Lord is. That's where I want to go. That's where I want to be. There could be five million people at this place, but if the presence of the Lord is not there, I don't want to be there. I want to be where the presence of the Lord is. Why? Because in the presence of the Lord, there is healing. There is deliverance. There is victory. There is breaking of addiction. There is encouragement and strength that comes in his presence, just from being in his presence. And that's where I want to be. If you turn with me, lastly, here to the book of Acts, chapter 15, starting in verse 16, it says, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called saith the Lord who doeth all these things. It's time that we bring the attention back to Jesus Christ in the church. It's time that we bring the attention back to him. It's time that we put him back in the center. We make him the center of everything that's happening. The Bible says he holds everything together. He holds everything together. Why would you not want him in the center of your marriage, in the center of your workplace and your work life, in the center of your difficulty and your trial, in the center? If you want him in the center of all those places, how much more in the center of the place where you gather? to worship him and to praise him and to bring honor to him. David took the ark and he put it in the center of 
the tabernacle. It wasn't just a furniture piece over here. Well, sometimes we talk about Jesus, but most of the time we just tell you how to get X, right? And whenever it's convenient, we bring Jesus into it to help you get to X or to help you get Y or to help you to get this new skill in your life or to help you climb this ladder in life uh it's convenient okay we'll pull jesus in now and we'll get his view on it how you want to get here we'll help you climb the corporate ladder let's give you some tips from jesus over here you know what happens you end up climbing the ladder of success but you end up on the wrong building you know anybody like that they climb the ladder of success they climb that ladder, and guess what? They find out at the end they ended up on the wrong building. No, we put Jesus at the center because out of Jesus Christ flows all of the things of life, all of the things. You bring me a topic, and I will show you where Jesus Christ is in the midst of that and where I can show you and point to him and say this is where you can get this truth from him. Any topic you want. I start with him and branch out. That's what we should be doing. But too often, we're looking out here on the outside and saying, how can I connect this to him? Instead of saying, how can I connect what I know about him? And it makes it work out here. We bring attention back to the midst of our praise, back to the midst of our worship. I may not be the most talented musician and vocalist in the world i don't really want to hear amens on that I'm t i can tell you honestly i'm not i'm not the most talented i'm not the smartest hold your amens i'm not the most eloquent speaker and now i'm even more nervous because we've got an english major here english teacher I'm not the most eloquent, but I'm a great pointer. I'm a great pointer. I do a really good job at pointing to Jesus Christ. I do a really good job at leading people and showing them who he is and pointing them to the one who said, you know what, Paul said, I don't have to come at you with enticing words. Paul was smarter than I am, I'll tell you that. Man, that man was smart. He was learned. He had knowledge. He could speak very eloquently, multiple languages, but he said, that's not how I come at you either. I come at you with the power and with the demonstration. I point you to the Lord Jesus Christ because that's what's important. I'm a great pointer. And when we praise and when we worship, we remember that Jesus Christ is in our midst. He is with us. He is blessing us. He is feeding us. And it doesn't have to be in this room that you praise and worship him. It could be at the workplace. Man, I'll tell you, you'll change somebody's life if you start praying for your lunch at work. You will change somebody's life because they're watching. They're watching. What is that? It's an act of worship. It's an act of praise. He bows his head and he prays at work, and he's one of those religious folks. No, you're not religious. You have a relationship, and you're thanking the one that gave that to you. They watch. People watch. Why do you do that? I'm just praising the Lord for what he's done for me, that he's given me this. Even though it's low calorie and I'm trying not to eat the bad way, but I'm, I'm thankful for this. We praise him. And when we do, when you start to live a life of praise, not just for 25 minutes when you stand up at church on Sunday morning and you sing a few songs. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about when you start to live a life of praise, when you start to, to focus on the Lord, and, and no matter what is coming your direction, no matter what you are seeing, no matter what is standing before you, you start to praise him through that. You start to worship him through that. It'll change your life. It'll change the way that your children live. It'll change the way, it'll change your colleagues' lives. And all of us will 
come to a place, hopefully, not just when you're here, but remember the presence of God. The presence of God goes with you. He's with you. But in Psalm 122, verse 1, it says, I was glad. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us go into his presence. Let us go into his house. Let us enter into where he is. Let us be together in relationship with him. And man, you can manifest that presence right there in your car, right there on the workplace, right there at that coffee table, right there with that student, right there with wherever you are. And you know what? It will make you glad. He has made me glad. Remember that? He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Praise and worship. Praise him in the midst.